Hallelujah. Amen and amen. I want to thank the Father for the privilege of being with us today on Daybreak with the King and to receive a new, the beginning of a new course today. And we thank the Father for Pastor Moody who is brought here to come and help us with recordings today. Father, we thank you for everything you are doing. Thank you for the Wednesday team. Lord, thank you for everyone who is part of this awesome assignment to bring your truth to the New Testament church. Lord, we pray that by your grace, you strengthen every one of us with the truth in your holy scriptures. Thank you for answering our prayer. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Men and brethren, today we're going to begin a brand new course titled Glorious Truths. The glorious truth. So you will be here with us. Uh, Apostle uh, Pastor Moody came with his son Alexander, and so if you uh, hear the sound of a little boy, Pastor Moody, you can attend to him. Don't worry, the recording is going on. At least for the next uh, 45, 50 minutes, we, we don't really need you. And so, brothers and sisters, having completed. Systematic Applied Kingdom Theology to, uh, last week. You know, the first three lessons, the first three courses in the 2019 Masterclass. Today, we begin a brand new course, and this brand new course is called The Glorious Truths. It's course 104, The Glorious Truths, The Fundamental Glorious Truths. And today, we're going to take two lessons, the preamble and the introduction. And if you understand the preamble and the introduction, you'll be in a place to appreciate what the Father wants to share with us in the course of this training. Men and brethren, the church in this generation is facing an identity crisis. The crisis is a result of layers of religious ideas injected at various times, particularly since the 4th century, which have beclouded the plain truth in the Holy Scripture since the 4th century. Human beings basically try to hijack the church of Yeshua HaMashiach. And in various ways, theologies were developed. Dogmas of men, traditions of men were developed. That when you put them together, their net effect is to create something other than what Yeshua purchased for us at the cross of Calvary. The result is that many people believe wrongly that even though saved, that Christians are actually sinners who are in need of redemption again. And because of that, there's so much sin consciousness. There's so much consciousness of sin and sinfulness in the average believer, the average Christian. The result is that they are not able to accept by faith the reality of the new birth experience, the reality that there are new creatures in Yeshua HaMashiach. Brothers and sisters, this distortion of the real identity of saints through religion has created a situation where people don't know what was purchased for them at the cross of Calvary. And that is what is actually very, very, you know, incomprehensible, so to say. You know, and so if you look at the New Testament scriptures, they are made of non effect by the traditions of men. Brethren, if you remember that Yeshua, while he was on earth, the enemy, while he was planting the children of Elohim in the earth tree, Satan was planting the tares. Not only that, in different ways we see the challenges in the early church that showed that something had intruded. John reported that some people who walked with them, in 1 John chapter 2 from verse 18, reported that some people who used to walk with them have fallen away. Because the spirit of the Antichrist was at work even in those days. And we saw in Acts 15 that the early church had to convene the first Jerusalem council. Church. Uh, the first Jerusalem council was to consider a serious problem arising from what we call Judaizers. The Judaizers are still there today. They wanted to, you know, to, to do everything as if the cross didn't happen, as if Yeshua didn't come. Judaizers were insisting that before you can be a Christian, you have to first be a Jew. 
And they had to convene the first Jerusalem council to deal with that and say no. And the council unanimously accepted that Gentiles can access the Father through the blood of Yeshua and is sufficient as long as they keep away from iniquity. Brothers and sisters, the point we are making is that the Lord has indicated that for his church to be ready for the return of the King of Kings, it must be taken away. It must be, it must be delivered of the spots of sin, wrinkles of traditions of men, and other such things that have, you know, muttled and muttled it up. The beauty of the church has gone. And that's why when the father saw the hasty tendency of his disciples, the first 12 apostles, you know, and Matthias who replaced Judas Iscariot, from receiving the radical nature of the new covenant, they were struggling. Even Peter, in order to go to the house of Cornelius, the father had to show him a vision and had to warn him not to call anyone unclean on account of their cultural background before Peter could accept to be and to do what he was required to do to the Gentiles. That kind of struggle was so much that they couldn't even move. They couldn't go to the places they were appointed to go because the mandate of the gospel was from Jerusalem through Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. They couldn't go. The Father had to allow persecution to come upon them. That persecution is what caused a man like Philip to run for his life and run to Samaria, open his mouth, and the anointing began to flow and drew a man who was only a deacon in the top heavy Jerusalem church, full of apostles, top heavy, one man alone, who was good enough to serve tables, he turned Samaria upside down. And so brethren, looking down from heaven, Yeshua couldn't but marvel at how the way these people were going, the work of the Great Commission would not be done. And so he had to bypass them. Brothers and sisters, none of us should ever think we are too much, too important. The Father is in the business that if you don't take what he has appointed you, if it works for you, he will go and raise even an unworthy vessel in the eyes of man. And so Yeshua had to go to the way of Damascus to arrest a young man, Saul, a young man who was a persecutor of the gospel, one who was, was an accessory to the murder of Stephen. Now, when Stephen was dying in Acts 7, Stephen didn't ask for fire and brimstone to come upon his tormentors. Stephen did what Yeshua did. He asked the Father not to lay the, 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 the act of killing him to the charge of these people. Stephen blessed them. Stephen chose to love rather than cause. And you know what? In Acts 7, Stephen chose the way of the kingdom. In Acts 9, just two chapters away, Yeshua responded and arrested Saul of Tarsus, the very young man who they threw their garments at his feet when they were stoning Stephen. And you know what happened? Yeshua arrested him and committed to the hand of that young man. He knew that he was zealous out of ignorance. He was zealous for Moses. He knew that if this young man knew the truth, the same zeal would be deployed to expand the kingdom. Arrested him. The rest is history. This young man, Saul, who became Paul, single-handedly was used by the Lord to expand the kingdom into Europe. The Roman Empire, of that day. Brothers and sisters, not just the extension, but more importantly, he chose him as the wise master builder of the church. The one who has the architectural plan of the church. The one to whom the real pattern of the church was committed, the revelation of the church, the revelation of the church as a corporate entity, as a bride of Yeshua, as the body of Yeshua, as a habitation of Elohim by his spirit, as the one new man of Elohim in the atrium, neither Jew nor Greek nor Gentiles, the one that, through which the middle wall of partition was broken down, Elohim chose him, and Yeshua began to commit to him revelation of the identity of the individual saint. And that identity is what will be shared with you in this course. 
glorious truth. The glorious truth represents the things that the Father has ordained each of us to be. We're not called to be members of churches. We're not called to be members of other human beings. That is why it is blasphemous for a minister to call a child of God, washed by the blood, my member. They are not your member, sir. They are not your member, ma. They are members of Yeshua HaMashiach. And if a leader does not accept this foundational truth, it is doubtful, doubtful if you can ever be used to build his church. Men and brethren, and that is important for us to know that the mandate to let the church know who it is, what was purchased at the cross, it was committed to the hand of Paul the Apostle. The wisdom given to him was so deep and so intense that even Peter had to acknowledge in the book of Peter, it is a piece that the wisdom the father gave to this young man was simply out of the way. And that those who try to wrestle with that wisdom, they create spiritual problems for themselves. Men and brethren, it's so important, therefore, for us to understand that to Paul the apostle, Yeshua downloaded, number one, the master plan of the church as a collective, and that's what you see in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15, where Paul said, according to the grace given unto me as a wise master builder. And number two, the full understanding of the watch of the individual saint redeemed by the blood. Now, these two things are connected. If you don't know the watch of the individual saints redeemed by the blood, you will never know the watch of the church. If you never know the identity of the individual saint from a spiritual point of view, you are going to be busy messing up the mind of that saint and trying to make him a religious person. And brethren, the king would like us to recourse, therefore, to what is called the Pauline Epistles for a clear understanding of what was accomplished at Calvary and how the new covenant and the new creation radically present us a new paradigm concerning those redeemed by the blood shed by Yeshua. This paradigm is one where the human being the one who is saved, the one who is redeemed, is a new creation. And it becomes the first level church, the church of Holy Spirit himself. As 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, you see, and not only that, the Lord wants us to know that it is not expedient to frame human beings as members of denominations, members of organizations, to the building they go into on certain holidays like Sunday and midweek services so that we can really understand the body, I mean the saints, as the very body of Yeshua and as his bride. <clears throat> so, course 104, the fundamental glorious truth is that the experiential manual. As you study diligently, there is need to check up through the word whether you are manifesting what the Lord says is you by his spirit, and for those who lead and teach saints, two paradigms present themselves for adoption, and the Lord respects your will. If you choose the negative one, the Lord will respect it. Paradigm number one, an approach where you truly understand as a leader what the new creation really means. This paradigm will propel you to a pattern of teaching them who they are in Yeshua, based on what he accomplished for them at the cross, and where this paradigm is faithfully understood and faithfully implemented, saints will know the truth which sets them free. They know Yahweh as their father. They will know Yeshua as their sovereign king. They will know Holy Spirit as a present help and guide and comforter and strength who will perfect their work with the father. They will also appreciate their human leaders as instruments of empowerment and to whom they should render accountability. Now that's one paradigm. The second paradigm is that of approach of teaching the various religious dogma which do not fully understand the new creation. And this is what you find in most Sunday school manuals. They are religious dogma. When you check them, at the heart of most Sunday school ma materials is attempt or, 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 or text to make people better members of the church they are in, not of Yeshua, not take their part in Yeshua, but members of the church, the rituals of the church, the traditions of the church, the distinctives of that church. And that is what happens in most 
even though there will be some things, you know, baptism, some things like uh, salvation and all that, at the heart of most things that people use for Sunday school is to make people a better member of a church. Brothers and sisters, if you as a leader choose to remain in this, and there is no reason why you should remain in this, you will be teaching people dogma passed down by men of old whose understandings of Yeshua were largely limited. They were impaired by their personal limitation because we know in part and we speak in part. So a man who lived 500 years ago, 400 years ago and died, what he knew may have been a speck and it may have been colored by the lenses through which he knew those things. And so the result is this. Somebody may exalt tongues and you grow up over the past 300, 400 years, that denomination is exalting tongues. Where is the power? No. Where is the person of the Holy Spirit? Where is this work that conforms us to the image of Yeshua? They don't know that because they stuck to what was revealed to a man 350 years ago, and that thing was highly inadequate. Not because the word was inadequate, but because his understanding was fundamentally flawed and therefore inadequate. So if you choose this approach of teaching people dogma, you will not be able to perfect them. It will lead sense to bondage. They will have stunted growth to become members of churches founded and led by pastors who are perceived as intermediary with an unknown Elohim, a known God. The result is that people will become codependent. When the pastor is not there, they feel a void. No, we're not supposed to feel a void if Yeshua truly is the head of the church. If truly Holy Spirit is the one in us, the same Holy Spirit that indwells Yeshua, if people embrace him. That is to say to you, brothers and sisters, especially if you're a leader, reformation is not an option. Reformation is a now agenda of the Most High Elohim. And it starts with the restoration of the proper identity of saints. Brothers and sisters, if reformation of the church, which will precede the return of King Yeshua, must take place, the basic starting point is to ensure that saints understand what happened when they gave their lives to him. And the inheritance that is theirs, through the catalytic events that took place at the place of his call, even Calvary, where at Golgotha, Yeshua, the God-man, Elohim, incarnated in human form, where he laid down his life for you and I. And if we don't know that it was for a purpose, then we are going to make a mistake. We need to understand what it means by it is finished. What does it mean? Men and brethren, it is finished. Open the pathway for a number of things to happen in the action. Number one, it opened the way for the emergence of the new creatures in the earth realm who are free of the spiritual DNA of Adam in, as their patrimony. And that's what it means by 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be Yeshua, is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Why? It is finished. Makes it possible. If you understand what it means that it is finished, you can teach the new creation with authority. You can tell people it doesn't matter what it used to be. A sangoma, a cult leader, a native doctor. It doesn't matter what it used to be. A prostitute. It doesn't matter what it used to be. A pimp. It doesn't matter what it used to be. Whatever your sins were, big or small, if you truly with your whole heart receive the convicting work of Holy Spirit, repent of your sins and embrace Yeshua and the salvation in him. What does Yeshua mean? Yahweh salvation. If you embrace it sincerely and truly, you become a new creation. Finish. You know what? Number two, in effect, the desire of the Father in all the ages for his sons to be those who live in the atrium. This atrium was not given to Satan. It wasn't given to demons. The atrium is given to human beings who have flesh and blood, so Satan became an illegal alien and craftily took it away, the crown, away from Adam and Eve. This atrium, according to the book of Psalm 115, verse 16, is given to the sons of men, and the sons are to be the sons of Yahweh. Adam and Eve were sons of Yahweh. It's a spiritual thing. It has nothing to do with gender or age. It has to do with 
connectivity with him. It has to do with having his DNA. It has to do with taking responsibility to manage the earth stream on his behalf. That's why the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 9, where we see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of Elohim, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So that was the idea, that was the pattern, that was the assignment of Yeshua, to bring many sons to glory. And so, the death of Yeshua at the cross paved the way for translation of people who were under dominion of Satan to come back to the Father and to come under the dominion of Yeshua HaMashiach. Men and brethren, Colossians 1 tells us from verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of saints in the light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. We are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. And this happens when saints are truly taught certain truths, to come to a place where they understand and it displaces all error. Brothers and sisters, take this seriously. Because for 1700 years, the church has operated on a false narrative. It's called the ABC paradigm. It's about church as a building. And therefore, if it's a building, it's about how many people come in there. We call it the attendance paradigm. Where Church is about attendance, numbers of people who are on the membership register of an organization. And so attendance becomes the prevailing paradigm of Christian religion. They count numbers. I have a thousand members. I have five thousand members. Oh, that man has ten thousand members. Oh, that lady, she has twenty-five thousand members who meet every week, two times a week, and we take that as index of divine approval. No, it's the ABC syndrome. Attendance, buildings, cash. It's about how many people. It's about building. What's the size of your building? What's the shape of your building? What's the beauty of your building? How prestigious is your building in the city? Cash is all about money. At the end of the day, follow the money trail. It's about how much comes into the till. ABC has been the prevailing reality of the church world, attendance, building cash. So people go to seminary. What is in their framework of mind is, hey, the day they will preach, they say they saw a dream and they were preaching to thousands. Oh, and that's what people regard as called thousands. What about the ten? Elohim wants you to disciple. You see, people despise. And because you want to keep the ABC going, People go and learn marketing gimmicks and marketing tricks and, and go to go and buy packages, church growth packages that tell them kind of things to do. ABC can only lead to the church of men, not the church of Yeshua. When church is about cash, how much money comes in, you begin to count human beings as cattle. They become like chattel. They become like owners. And they become like owned by the owners. The owners being the Nicolaitan priests who preside over the people, not accountable. They can dip their hand into the treasure and do whatever they like with the money because it's their own. The people are owned by them. The rebuilding title deed is in their name and the money is their own. ABC is the bane of the church. Men and brethren, while it's not necessarily bad to have numbers or growth, and we're not saying that, growth can come if you get it right. Listen, while it's not bad to have buildings, we need buildings, you know, but not for ABC system. Buildings are places of empowerment. They are training centers. Buildings are places of fellowship, places through which we jumpstart into the community to affect and impact the community. So we're not saying it's bad. We're not saying money is bad in itself because by prosperity, the kingdom is spread abroad. The Father still gives allocations for assignment. What is certainly bad is a situation 
where one is in ministry for attendance, for building, for cash. And brothers and sisters, we need to understand that the Lord has something greater and mightier for those he calls. The day he told, he arrested Peter after he's resurrected from the dead. He said, do you love me more? And he said, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Feed my lamb. It's about feeding the people. And then remember in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter said, the elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder. And a witness of the sufferings of Yeshua. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. What did he tell them? Feed the flock of Elohim which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither has been lost over Elohim's heritage, but being examples to the flock. That's what he told them. Brothers and sisters. That's why leaders must hear and process the truth. That saints are our main business. The Father has given them to us to empower, to strengthen, to perfect, to enable them to discover their identity in Yeshua, to know who they are in Him and know what He has put in them. When we have this paradigm, we will realize that we are to serve them. We are not called to just boss them and take them and use them. And those who are assigned to us, we are going to take care to pray for them until Yeshua is found in them, to feed them the pure truth of the world until their minds are renewed, their hearts are transformed, until their emotions that are damaged receive healing. We are to serve them with zeal and humility. We are to serve them. We are to raise them up as an army of people who buy into the mission statement of Yeshua in Luke chapter 10, Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save the lost. And when we do it this way diligently, you know what? They will know the truth. And the truth they know that sets them free. That's why this course is titled Glorious Truth. To tell you the truth about the real identity of saints, what Yeshua has purchased for them, who they are in him and who is in them. If you understand these glorious truths and teach people these truths, they will never stumble. And if you are a believer, a saint, no matter your age in the Lord, if you understand these truths and give Holy Spirit space to form Yeshua fully in you and walk in the light of these truths, you'll be strong and stable. You'll grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. Now, the assignment for this lesson one is, please share three main things you take away from this introductory lesson. Two, what are your expectations from this lesson? Let's go on to lesson two. Lesson two, brothers and sisters. Lesson two of the course 104 Glorious Truths is foundations of the Glorious Truths. And the first part of it is this. Religion teaches people that, oh, you go to look for God, you look for him, you look for him. And then they encourage you to pray and go to church and do this and do that. Then if you look for him hard enough, you'll find him. And it's based on a distortion of Jeremiah 29, 13, who says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There's a context in which Jeremiah was living. The New Testament church or the New Testament believer is not the same standing as the Old Testament. The New Testament uh, paradigm of salvation shows that everything about salvation is Elohim initiated. He initiated. Do you know that? Yeshua was slain before the foundation of this world. Before Adam and Eve were created, Yeshua, the, the Godhead knew that Adam and Eve would miss it. And Yeshua had volunteered that he would come. To pay the price to recover. That's what uh, uh, Revelation 13 verse 8b, the B part of it says, it was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And brothers and sisters, we need to also understand that the Father, everything about salvation, listen, when did he love you? Is it when you were born again? When you were righteous? No. While we are yet in sin, without strength, Yeshua died for us. Before you knew him, he knew you. And he made all the provisions for your salvation. It is so important to understand that, look, he, he, the, the, the utilitarian gospel has messed up the mind of people. People go to church. Their motive is to find a marriage partner. They have been single for long. Their motive is to find a business partner. Their motive is to be associated with a popular preacher. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, 
To go into a building or be part of a ministry is secondary. The very first part of the whole equation is the fact that Elohim ordained our salvation. And Holy Spirit is brooding over the earth rim, touching consciences to tell people you can't remain the way you are. The way you are will only lead to eternal damnation. Convicting of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. And those who respond, Holy Spirit does something to them. He convicts them and they respond to him. He inspires in them the grace to be repentant. And when they're in that crisis, you know what? He shows them Yeshua. As having paid the price for them. In nanoseconds, this can happen. In nanoseconds, this whole transaction. And then, as we respond, he shows us the love of the Father. He draws us near. He infuses us with faith to receive. In other words, everything about our redemption. As the Pauline epistles again reveal to us, and you can only understand what I'm saying when you read Romans, read uh, Galatians, Ephesians, read epistle to the um, uh, Corinthians, and read that to the uh, Thessalonians, read his epistle to Timothy and to Titus, and the book of Hebrews, when you read these things, you see one thing. It's all from Elohim. It's all by His grace. It's not by our labor. It's not by our strength. It's not by how much we seek. It is by His mercy imparted into us and given to us. When you understand that, you understand the positive aspect of election. I'm not talking about those who say who, who advance eternal security. And they use some scriptures in Romans. They distort them to mean what it doesn't mean. What I'm saying is this, everything about our salvation was packaged by heaven. And if we are open, Holy Spirit will bring us to it. And so, men and brethren, Romans 5, 6 to 8 says, For when we're yet without strength, in due time, Yeshua died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man, some will dare to die. And Elohim commended his love towards us, in that while we're yet sinners, Yeshua died for us. And this is precisely the very meat of salvation. We are delivered from the power of Satan, sin, and death. Not by the blood of animals or birds, but by the blood of Elohim in the person of the God-man, Yeshua HaMashiach. And men and brethren, we know and we need to know that the grace of our Father in Him is awesome. The glorious truth is the Father's opportunity to tell us what has been happened, what has happened in us. Brothers and sisters, let this truth be re-emphasized until it sinks in. Before we're born again, Yeshua had already paid the price for our salvation. He has used various ways to draw us near to himself. And if you look back, you discover that it's not by your strength. Even the day you were saved, the Father orchestrated it. You know, I want to say to you, you know what, I don't know about you, but I know that the year the Father arrested me finally, I'd answered what I caused, nothing happened. I'd sought for him in books, nothing happened. I read tracts and magazines, nothing happened. But I can't forget that the Father allowed a few things to be orchestrated. One of them was one of my shows as a showbiz impresario. In my, that was the business I was in before I was saved. In one of the shows... I remember at Imo Concord Hotel in the world Nigeria, somebody drowned in drink. Alcohol passed out. Because my shows then were promoted, you know, they were sp sponsored by breweries. And I know there was one called Eastern Breweries in Imo State of Nigeria, sponsored a young man drank and passed out. Was I rattled? You can bet on that. You can imagine in your show. The show stopped. Praise the Lord, there were two people. One a nurse who had understanding of what to do. When they would say a case like that, they began to pump at this person, pump at, pump at, pump at. You know what? After almost 25 minutes or so, there was a sign of life. And eventually that guy woke up, survived, that rattled me enough to stop shows and to see how the father does things. A few weeks later, here comes a young lady who used to know me at college. We used to know 
you know, I respected her. She was a Christian. I respected her being a Christian. And it was, you know, you can imagine the wild environment of campus. And she respected me as a leader of the students or secretary of the student union. One day we just met on the road. And she had boldness to share the love of the Father with me. Did the most she can. And then told me that there was a revival going on. She invited me. I said, I will come. I went. Nothing happened. And this lady had boldness to come to my place to share the word with me. And one day she invited me to a meeting. And do you know, brothers and sisters, the Father broke through. Holy Spirit showed me the field of my life. The, 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 his love, he showed me what Yeshua has done for me. And I can still remember where I was standing after so long. After over 30 years, I can still remember where I was standing. I can still remember the cloth I was wearing, the color of it, because it was an encounter with the Lord. Men and brethren, that's what he's still doing to everyone. Nobody comes in the kingdom because you can pray more than others, because you are righteous more than others. No. It's the Father's business. In John 6, 44, no man can come to me, Yeshua says, except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I'll raise him up on the last day. John 6, 65, and he said, Wherefore said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Everything about redemption, our salvation, is Elohim initiated. He orchestrates it, my brethren. And I want to say this to you. If you understand this basic foundation, you will be truly ready for what the Father wants to release for us in the glorious truth. Because all of the glorious truths are gifts of grace we receive from our Heavenly Father. It's not by ability. It's not by our strength. And so you'll be open. If you read the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 1 to 8, we are told in verse 4, you know, but the Elohim, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we're dead in sins, had quickened us together with Yeshua, for by grace we are saved. Then he says again, verse 8, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of Elohim. It's all by grace. For Elohim so, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish we have it, uh, everlasting life. And therefore, it's very important for us to embrace the reality that the new birth is a, a, a gift. Salvation is a gift. Redemption is a gift. If we realize that, then the question is, what is the full basket of gifts that make up what, who we are as new creation? That's what this course is all about. This is a course you cannot afford to miss. And coming right off the Understand of systematic applied kingdom theology. I want to say to you, this is a beautiful set up by the Father. If you understand the glorious truth and receive them and hold on to them and walk in them, no matter what situation betides you, you are going to see a whole new life, a life that you never knew was possible, a life of grace, a life of extreme grace by which the Father will be able to show you. And that's why for this course, for you to understand it, you need to understand what happened in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3. In Genesis 1, Elohim created womankind. And in verse 26, he said, let us create man in our own image after our own likeness. <clears throat> let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Man was created to rule this earth realm. To govern this earth realm, the earth realm is to be governed by humankind. And the Lord wants us to know that for that to happen, it meant that Elohim created man to be his crown jewel. The crown jewel of his creation is humankind. And Satan knew. And the command that Elohim gave to man, look at the way he created Adam. Elohim Stooped down, scooped the raw edge, molded it. He looked at it. When it appeared, everything was okay. He breathed the breath of life, his own spirit, a measure of it, into that lifeless body. 
as Genesis 2 7 says, they touch when they the measure of the spirit of Elohim is bread, touch that lifeless body, man became a living soul. So man had three dimensional being. The spirit man that came from Elohim, the body that came from the earth, and the soul that easily walks in cahoot with the body, the rim of self-expression. The soul is the mind, the will, the emotion. And inside the mind, you have the thought process. The mind that thinks, processes, you have the imagination that envisages, sees, vivid, the memory that traps or stores what experiences one had. And when people don't understand it, they don't know that Satan, what he did on the day of the fall was to cause a dislocation. Elohim's plan is that his, the, the spirit man, which is under the influence of the spirit of Elohim, will rule the soul and the body. What Satan did in the book of Genesis chapter 3 was to essentially tempt Eve so much that the soul of Eve yearned for what was forbidden. And as she yearned, her soul snapped out of being under subjection to her spirit man, and then her soul from that day, the soul of man, began to rule man. And that is what makes man carnal by birth, natural, fleshly. And brothers and sisters, the disobedience of Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed Elohim, who told them not to eat of the fruit of the tree, when they disobeyed him and obeyed Satan, they made him their master. Because the principle in Romans 6 is whoever you make, whoever you obey becomes your master. So they displaced Elohim from being master of their lives. And because of that, because they, they, that disobedience, they handed over the mantle of ruling the world, of taking care of this earth trip, they handed it over to Satan. That's how Satan became the god of this world. Something Yeshua didn't dispute at the temptation in the wilderness when Yeshua said, when, when Satan told Yeshua, look, I, I can give you any of these cities and kingdoms if you bow before me because he's mine. Yeshua didn't tell him he's a liar. Why? He took it away from Adam validly and legally, though by subtlety. And so, the point we are making is this. The Father wants us to know that the entire essence of the gospel is not of what he should did for us, but to appropriate, to reckon them as done deal and walk in that. And therefore, come to a place where we press in and our spirit man begins to rule our soul and our body. That is a vital part of redemption. If it doesn't happen in you, you'll be having yo-yo one day up, one day down. If it's happening in you, but you're careless, one day up, one day down. Emotion will rule you. Uh, what somebody said will rule you. What you feel will rule you. The Father wants us to be delivered from that. Be delivered from our soul rule. We're not supposed to be ruled by our soul. We're supposed to be ruled by Holy Spirit who rules our spirit, man, or heart, which in turn rules our soul. The rim of self-expression of our emotions, our imagination, of our memory, and rule the body. The body is a tabernacle. Whatever rules inside, the tabernacle will follow. So if your spirit man rules your being, the body is going to follow suit. So brethren, we need to know something. That if we understand the glorious truths and walk in them, we are going to have the wisdom of Elohim released to us in a measure that will cause us to walk in wisdom of Elohim in all situations. We're not going to be victims. We're going to be victors. If we understand that, and that's why I'd like to recommend to you the course Understanding Yeshua Jesus, course 102, is available on the website www.kingdomboostclub.com. Also, you need to understand course 103, Understanding Holy Spirit. And if you put them all along with this course, if you understand this course, the truth is that you'll be a victor, not a victim. You'll be on top, not below. Because you will not know who you are. You'll be open 
for the Father to do what he wants to do with you, you are not going to limit him. The Father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. And you will allow him to truly give you the kingdom and walk in you so that you will now begin to be one who he can depend upon. Brothers and sisters, Christian religion works on an opposite paradigm from what I've described. Christian religion wants you to feel good when you're inside the building. When you're receiving the high octane, those high octane preachments that come from the pulpit, Christian religion wants you to feel good when you are connected to a man or a woman. When you hear their voice, it wants you to feel good when you are doing activities. But the gospel of the kingdom is about you understanding your identity, embracing your identity in Yeshua, walking in your identity. And that is what the six, the, I mean, the glorious truths. At the last revision, it was 16. We don't know. We can't say it's particular whether the Father will remain the 16 or you add to each revelation. For we know in part, we speak in part. But I want to say this to you, brothers and sisters. If you open your heart to understand what the Father is showing us in this course, no one born of a woman can deceive you. Satan cannot deceive you. Demons cannot sidetrack you. And the Father loves you. That's why he's bringing this course. He wants us to walk in truth that sets free. He wants us to walk in confidence within our identity. And he wants us to be instruments of reproducing his grace in other people. You see, the truth you know will set you free. And it will enable you to set others free. If you're a leader and you don't know these truths, you won't be able to teach them. Because you can't teach what you don't have. So I want to encourage everyone who is a leader who is on this course, open your heart, open your mind, open your will. You have nothing to lose. There's a guarantee from the Father. You have nothing to lose in the study of these truths. They are there in plain sight, only that the veil of religion covers them. And people are being programmed to be members of churches and members of ministers. The glorious truth makes you a member of Yeshua to discover who you are in him and so you can grow up into him in all things and then that will enable you to be able to receive from your brothers and sisters and also pour out to them. And when we are walking in that pattern, and when this is our lifestyle, when this is our revelational reality, you know what? Anywhere we show up, people will know that sons of Elohim are right there. We love you dearly. And this is, this is something we are passionate about. That every one of the remnant of Elohim, wherever they are in the world, they shall walk in the fullness of light so that they can take over and establish the ordinance of the kingdom wherever they find themselves in the community, in the city, in the state, in the, in the, in the nation. And the Father can use us to go ye into the nations of the world to disciple the nations and bring them under subjection. My brothers, my sisters, don't shun the truth. Open your heart for the truth. The uh, assignment today, please, can you, this particular lesson, can you just give us a summary and tell us about, give us a summary of this lesson. And number two, share with us any three things that you learned from this particular lesson. And before we go, we're going to talk about a bad day and an anniversary. Bad day, Apostle, Do Apostle Jacob Chaco, the IMF, leader and global school of business leader in India, he, his birthday is today. And I think he was born in the area of Kerala where Thomas Aquinas, Thomas the Doubter died. I think that's the general geographical area. But he's been in Port Blair, in Andaman and Nicoba Islands for a long time. And he has a passion for Asia. And that's why we're coming alongside him. You know what? To the global school of ministry, IMF and the Global Missions Board, India has the potentials to raise millions of missionaries that will take the world. Apostle Dr. Joseph, uh, Dr. Uh, Jacob Chaco, you and your wife, Pastor Daisy, we love you all and we say happy birthday. And today is also the 25th wedding anniversary of Apostle Dr. Didi Oparacha and Apostle Dr. Julia Oparacha. Apostle Didi, he heads a ministerial alliance. He's an educator with interest in the STEM 
system of education, and he just has a passion for transformation. His wife, Apostle Dr. Julia, a pharmacist, she is the deputy president of IMF USA and the, 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 the senior pastor of Joy Unlimited uh, 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 Fellowship International in Meriden, Connecticut. You know, she and her husband, they've done tremendous work. I will pray the Father for grace for them that having brought them through these 25 years, he will take them to the next, if the Lord tarries, the next 25 years will be more glorious. And all allocations for the assignment, both spiritual and physical and material and financial, the Lord will supply to them. We're going to see Apostle Dr. Julia and Dr. Uh, Apostle Dr. Uh, Didi. We're going to see them pretty soon. IMF USA Conference, July 19 to 21. And those of you who are watching, I'd like you to, to take note that whether you are already in IMF or you want to join IMF, or you are not in, but you want to see how the Father can just bring His presence and glory down, please contact either Pastor Ron Shepard, or Pastor Janda Shepard, President of IMF USA, or Apostle Dr. Julia Parocha, or Minister Rose Ichuka, or, or uh, Teacher Stephen Foster. You know what? Contact any of them. They'll give you details so that we, we can all meet together in Four Point Sheraton, for the IMF USA at Meriden, Connecticut, July 19 to 21. It's going to be awesome. And a week before then, IMF UK will be hosting the national conference at 821 Old Kent Road. Pastor Dubai Adefala will be very excited to meet with you for that US that UK conference. It will start on a Friday and end on a Saturday all day. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome beyond measure. The heavens will open and we're going to see the body of Yeshua come together. It will be a wonderful thing. Before we go, Apostle Brenda Jameson, who has done a very good work as as the director of IMF USA Women in Ministry, she'll be having a meeting this weekend, Friday, with women in ministry. If you're a woman in ministry in the United States of America or have interest in the United States of America, please, you know, get to have the uh, calling numbers on Friday and it will be an awesome time of fellowship in the presence of the Lord. Having said that, brethren, you know, how it's time to put on your spiritual seat bells. We are about to take off tomorrow. And will attain rapidly cruising speed on this course that will blow your mind. 16 truths, if you know them and walk in them, you can never be the same again. Your life will be dramatically shifted and altered in favor of your identity. It's time to pray. And then Pastor Moody and Alexander will close us out by, by, by switching that green team. If you go to the camera, you're going to see by the lower right, when I finish praying, you just click it when I finish praying. You see, a, did you see the button there? Father, we thank you so much for your son, uh, Pastor Moody, and his son, Alexander, who have come at short notice to come and take the camera today as Pastor Grace is not available. Lord, we pray that your, your grace will rest upon them. Bless Apostle Didi and Apostle Julia. Bless Apostle Jacob Chaco and his wife, Daisy. Bless the IMF USA conference coming, the IMF UF UK conference coming, and bless the IMF Money Ministry meeting this weekend. We bless you, Father. We say, have your way. Be glorified. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen.